Mount Sinai is the first place in the world to successfully transplant human trachea. This is a long segment tracheal transplant, meaning taking, replacing the windpipe down a long distance, which nobody had done, down to the level of essentially where the windpipe splits into the right and left side for the lungs. We took this from concept, the idea of why don't we transplant the trachea, uh, to the laboratory um, where we did studies, you know, in the most basic of science, animal studies, and over the course of 30 years brought this to the clinic, brought this to the patient. And um, to see a concept that was just a dream become a reality and really help a patient I have to say it's probably the most fulfilling thing that I've had an opportunity um, to, and really blessed to, to be a part of. A first ever surgery, a first in human surgery, um, requires a great deal of preparation and, and that preparation comes from the Transplant Institute and Dr. Florman and his incredible group. And setting this up in a way that you could find the right donor and the family that was willing to allow that to happen. An institute and a group of leaders like Dr. Florman that were able to set this up so that we had the procurement from the donor in one room and right next door was the ability to do the transplantation, the recipient. You can't imagine the type of coordination that takes. When he came and said that this is what he wanted to do, uh, we had a lot of meetings and it was clear he was serious. And I told him that he would need to perfect this in deceased donors. And we got permission from families of recently deceased people through the Oregon Bank in New York for Dr. Jenden to go often at two o'clock in the morning, often on days he didn't want to be out at two o'clock in the morning with our liver transplant team and go to procurements where he refined his skills. And this was all with the permission of the donor family and did this so that he could learn how to take the trachea out with its blood supply. And he did this more than uh, 10 times. You know, we see a lot of patients with uh, tracheal defects and we do a lot of tracheal surgery. And, and there's a group of patients that are out there that suffer from progressive disease of the trachea where it becomes worse and worse and worse. And Sonia was one of those patients. Sonia came to me probably five or six years ago and she had um, been intubated for an asthma attack and they damaged her airway pretty severely. She had had several surgeries, four or five surgeries to try to reconstruct it. And each time they chip away and cause damage to more and more of the trachea. In order for her to maintain an airway, she had to keep a long segment tracheostomy in, which is fraught with problems. They tend to clot, they tend to plug, they're very dangerous, and if they fall out, she suffocates. And she got to a point where it was such a difficult thing for her that she eventually said, if you can't do something for me, it's not worth it for me to live. And Sonia is an intelligent, very well-educated woman. Um, she's a social worker by trade. She's very well aware of what goes on in the medical field. And she's very much in touch with the realities of this type of decision. And so we had a multiple conversations about it. And um, we talked about if we opened up the human tracheal transplant trial, um, you know, she was clear, she wanted to participate. She had no wavering about this. She knew that this is something she wanted to do. What we essentially did was we had to determine if the donor was going to allow us to procure the trachea and all of the vessels necessary. And when I say allow, that means that we do the preparation surgery. So we open up in a standard fashion. We expose the trachea, the thyroid gland, all of the blood vessels. And we have to make a decision right there whether or not this graft looks like it's going to survive because if you take the graft out and procure the trachea, you now have somebody in the other room that has been opened and prepared. And, and when Sonia's asleep as the recipient in the other room, 
she now has opened up and the defect of the windpipe is so low that if we don't make this work, we have really an untenable situation. So procedurally, we open up the donor and define the trachea. We define the arteries and the blood vessels coming off of the thyroid gland into the carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. Those are the vessels that we're going to hook up to. Those are the vessels that are going to nourish the graft. After dissecting out the trachea and the blood vessels, we make a decision right there. Are we ready to go? Is this something that we want to continue on with? And we made that decision because, frankly, it looked very good. The blood vessels were uh, well-defined. Um, the trachea length, we, we could get exactly what we needed. And midway through, we make a decision to bring in the recipient. So that's when the green light goes on. Sonia comes into the room. We prepare her. Um, we opened her up. Uh, remove the disease windpipe that was stented open with, with a tracheostomy and prepare her blood vessels because we're going to do microvascular transfer, taking the graft with six or seven arterial and venous anastomoses and hooking up those blood vessels into the recipient using microsurgery. So when the graft comes out, we put that on ice and that's called the cold ischemic time. And from that point on, we're under the clock. As many people know in transplantation, that time period where the graft doesn't have blood supply is a critical time period. And even more critical is the time that the graft is being actually sewn in to the recipient, which is called warm ischemic time. And because nobody has ever done this, we didn't have any idea how well or not well this graft would tolerate not having blood flow, ischemia. So we moved very quickly, and with the help of you know, Dr. Miles and Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Di Maria on anesthesia, the team worked very quickly to get the graft in and then revascularize it. And in the revascularization, we have to hook up the arteries, which bring the blood to the graft, and the vein, which deliver the blood out from the graft very expeditiously. But I would say that in the 25, 28 years of, of, of practicing head and neck you know, surgery, there was probably nothing more exciting than releasing the blood vessels and watching the graft actually come alive and the entire length of the trachea all the way down to the lung uh, bleed, which means that it's, it's alive and it's, and it's well vascularized because that was the, uh, the biggest hurdle. That was the medical dogma for 60 years that you couldn't get the trachea revascularized. And, and that, that really um, was what made this possible. It feels good that everything went well and everything is working. I feel now I'm much stronger than I was before. Like I can take that breath. I can feel the breath. It feels so easy to breathe. If you talk to ENT surgeons around the country, um, every single one of them could probably name one or two patients that would be in this situation where they're stuck with a tracheostomy and really the only potential option after failing multiple revisional surgeries would be the potential for trachea transplant. There are patients literally around the world who are interested in this. I don't know that this will be something done in every hospital or even many hospitals or maybe even more than this hospital, but I do know that this fits a need. This is almost an orphan need in the world of, of tracheal problems where the damage is so extensive and the only way to consider not being tied to a tube and maybe even a machine is to have a transplant. I suspect Dr. Jendon uh, is going to see a lot of this. Now we have an opportunity, an option for patients that really didn't have an option. So I think it's going to be a great experience to be able to finally take these patients that are really in dire straits. Um, you know, this is uh, an opportunity for life for a lot of patients that had no other opportunities. I would say Mount Sinai is now 
probably the center in the world that has an experience with a transplant and can parlay that hopefully into offering this to many more patients.